Hello, everybody, and welcome to Clear Water Innovation, an initiative that supports water-related scientific research in home labs. Today, I have with me Sonia Mitchelluk from New Jersey, a rising freshman at Carnegie Mellon University. She will be talking about her project, Optimizing Taxonomic Identification of Chironomidae Dactera for a Novel Method of Monitoring Our Global Fresh Water Supply Using DNA Barcoding. Sonia is a 2020 Regeneron Science Talent Search finalist, 2019 Stockholm Junior Water Prize winner, 2019 Intel ISIF awardee, and 2016 Broadcom Masters finalist. Hi Sonia, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me on today. Thank you for being here. Let's talk about your project. So what problem were you trying to solve and what inspired you to pursue this particular solution? Water scarcity is listed by the World Economic Forum as a major global risk of the coming decade. Um, our population is relying more and more on surface water for drinking. Simultaneously, we're developing the wetlands that act as water filtration systems. We need better ways to monitor the health of our freshwater resources um, to help us to manage our water resources and get more data to make science the language of the debate. Yeah, that's very true. So what was your solution? Um, so my proposed solution is a novel method of bioassessment utilizing the larval chironomid and um, uh, a technique called DNA barcoding. Bioassessment is basically looking at the organisms present in an ecosystem. This is often done with fish, algae, um, microorganisms, and macroorganisms like macroinvertebrates. Um, and by looking at the organisms present in the ecosystem, they're kind of a direct reflection of any environmental stressors acting upon that ecosystem. Um, so you can really get a feel for any cumulative environmental stressors from nutrient pollution, heavy metal pollution, um, uh, excess silt deposits, toxins, you name it. Um, so this proposed solution is a new methodology for assessing waterway health that shows potential to be the world's first global standard and also shows potential to be the first ever standard method utilizing genetics technology. And what was very interesting is in this study, I was able to see how um, different midge species have such uh, specific preferences of where they like to live. Only 13% of the um, genera noted lived in both coastal plain and the Piedmont, which is very interesting. It shows how they've really um, they really have like a very, yes, they've evolved to fill very uh, specific ecological niches, which shows how they can be really helpful for seeing what's in the water. So Sonia, can you tell us what DNA barcoding is? Absolutely. So DNA barcoding is a technology that allows you to take um, a, to, allows you to sequence a gene um, and from there, uh, identify an organism down to genus or species level. Um, it all starts with isolating the DNA, and there are multiple methods to do so. Um, in my research, I looked at various techniques that could be used for citizen science initiatives, um, ones that were cost effective, safe, and fairly easy to use. Um, once you have your isolated DNA, um, there's something called PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, which amplifies that gene and then it's sent into sequencing. And what you get back from sequencing is basically a digital code of DNA. It lists out all the individual nucleotides. And from there, after you edit the sequence a little bit, um, or once you trim those sequences, you can send it into a database and look for database matches. And from there, you can precisely identify that organism. Another great thing about DNA barcoding is once you identify an organism, you can publish your sequence into the database. So it allows these databases to grow for the scientific community. Through this initiative, I was also able to publish some of my sequences um, and also find some novel sequences that could point to some new species. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. How does it improve upon existing solutions? Um, there isn't necessarily a global standard. Um, currently, where I live in New Jersey, there's actually different methodology um, based on geology. For example, there's like the Pine Barrens, um, and they have almost their own like their own whole algorithm just just for that one part of New Jersey. It becomes very difficult to compare across sites and to compare across regions. Additionally, um, when it comes to working with invertebrates, 
Um, a lot of these initiatives rely on expert taxonomists to get past the family or order level with um, identification and morphological taxonomic identification can be very difficult, um, especially because there's a lot of cryptic species in, in the entomological world. And when it comes to the fact that there's just, there's 10, estimated 10,000 species of midge worldwide, about 5,000 species of mayfly, it becomes very difficult to distinguish them and figure out what actually is living in that water. Um, additionally, accuracy of reference materials can be very difficult, um, and an estimated 65% of taxonomic ident taxonomically identified um, species and um, genera are incorrectly identified. So the concept of integrating DNA barcoding allows it to be compared by looking at its genetic sequence and comparing it to sequences and databases, you get very clearly what that sample is. Awesome. So it looks like you really went out and did a lot of field work when you were collecting those samples. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience for that? Yeah, absolutely. So I had 13 different sites. Um, I used, I developed a statistical sampling plan to find the ideal sites to sample. Um, and this was based on urbanization, um, geological factors, and other ecological factors. Um, and these sites ranged from very pristine mountain streams to um, kind of muddy bottomed rivers that go past a lot of urban areas in New Jersey. Uh, I followed the, I guess the current procedure where you use something called a D-frame net um, to collect a macroinvertebrate sample use something called like a stratified random sample to make sure you get every part of the stream. Um, and from there you would get um, netfuls of organic matter. Um, and rather than identifying all of the organisms simply down to order and family level, the chironomidae were picked out, put in a grid, and then a dye was used to pick which ones would be sampled, um, randomly pick ones for further sampling. Um, simultaneously though, um, the actual New Jersey um, Department of Environmental Protection procedure was implemented. Um, so this way I could compare what I was getting to the standard. Um, I also used a lot of historical data, um, especially in sites that have been sampled for like the past uh, decade by local citizen scientists to get a feel for what was going on there. Wow, that sounds like really <laughs> in-depth physical work. How did you actually implement your project locally? Um, so a couple of years ago, I made a proposal to build on an existing water uh, research institute, a microbiology and genetics lab um, in which um, uh, genetics and DNA barcoding could be integrated into citizen scientist programs and also make it easier for them to taxonomically identify organisms in house. Um, Taxonomic services can be very expensive and even go up to $80 a sample. Um, and expert taxonomists, unfortunately, are in short supply. Um, and so I thought by having this in-house resource, it could cut out um, kind of like that third party um, and help the institution overall save money. Um, I began over the years um, acquiring grants and funding, um, writing grant proposals and reaching out to various people. Um, and also trying to find um, the optimum equipment to put into this lab, um, figuring out storage, reagents, um, training, the, training staff, uh, writing standard operating procedures, writing protocols that was tailored to the equipment, um, accepting donations of equipment and kind of putting it all together. Um, and right now it is a functioning lab um, and COVID-19 permitting, um, there will be uh, students in there soon in the local high schools learning about DNA barcoding. Um, we've already worked to integrate it into the curriculums of many local high schools. So Clearwater Innovation is about doing water-related research at home and showing that everybody is capable of conducting research no matter what your resources are. So I know that your project is a home project. Would you have any insight or advice you would share for people who are also looking to research from home, especially in quarantine? Uh, for doing um, scientific research at home, I highly recommend picking a topic that you're highly passionate about. Um, I also recommend setting up a designated lab space um, keeping everything very well organized through a lab journal, um, organizing reagents. Um, I've actually built my own small lab with my family in my basement, and we have a lot of intricate shelves that allow us to store um, various reagents, specimens, artifacts, um, and equipment. 
Um, that's something I highly recommend to conserve space. Another fun thing is recycling old materials um, to kind of create your space um, uh, for storage purposes and also for containing um, specimens and reagents. There is um, there is so much just by going out into the natural world, there's like endless things to discover and to research. So by researching something at home, you don't necessarily have to stay confined inside, but there's so many things you can go out and so many, I guess, so many animals to observe, so many um, behaviors to watch, so many things to collect and to be inspired by. And so I feel like there's all kinds of stuff, just a walk in the woods can bring like so much inspiration. And you can take it home to your lab, analyze it and make a breakthrough. That is very true. Well, I'm jealous of your basement lab because mine, mine moves around, but the other day I was putting samples on my bed and I was like, that's probably not the best thing to do. And that's why this was created. I think my parents had enough of stuff infiltrating other rooms of the house. <laughs> There's certain things that just have to stay there. For example, we have multiple frogs down there and they just, they stay there. They go nowhere else. Okay, yeah, I will not put a frog on my bed. <laughs> yeah. Um, but this brings me to the most important question, I think, which is why is the environment important to you? Why do you spend so much effort working on water-related issues? I feel like it's easy to, for humans to forget that we don't necessarily live in our own bubble outside of nature and the environment. We're a part of this environment. We take things from it. We contribute to it. Um, we take in the clean clean water, we take in food, we take in resources. Um, and so we have to give back so the cycle continues. Um, when I was seven, I was very fortunate to get to um, uh, meet an ethnobotanist who had spent uh, many years in the Amazon rainforest um, researching plants and um, indigenous people. Um, and she showed me how to look at even the most unsuspecting plot of land um, and how to make connections, how to read the landscape and it just like it all kind of came together by looking at evidence of who had lived there, what had lived there, um, and how humanity had influenced the plants growing there and how that influences the animals present um, and what species that draws in. Um, it really opened my eyes and it really inspired me. And so now I see if um, a lot of times when people go about constructing on a site, they don't necessarily see the full picture. And I feel like it's really important to gather as much data as possible and use it to back up um, environmental regulations, use it to enforce regulations, and really use it to make informed environmental decisions. And then also with climate change, and it's very scary, <laughs> um, but I feel like it's really important to advocate for using, you know, hard facts and just raw data to influence political decisions and land development decisions. Um, and I feel like water is a great place to start. Um, it's almost like the veins, I guess, of our planet. It runs everywhere. There's so many organisms that live in water. Um, and you could start small. So I have a small creek in my yard and I've been working um, you know, to sample it. And just even working in my community, I've been able to help um, uh, over 50 acres of lands kind of get preserved by working with various institutions and groups of people. Um, and it's a small difference in the scheme of things, but it really, for the organisms living there, it's not a small difference. That was very <laughs> empowering. I feel inspired. <laughs> yes, Sonia. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for being here with us today. You're doing such amazing, amazing work. And I feel so inspired right now to go out to a lake and hug the lake because, I mean, you really appreciate these organisms so much. You can find Sonia's blog write-up and other great resources at www.clearwaterinnovation.org. We would also appreciate it if you followed our Instagram at We Impact Community and subscribe to our YouTube channel for more amazing STEM content. Thank you for watching.